Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John, Mark chapter 14, and uh, verse number 33, beginning with Mark chapter 14. Wanted to focus as we prepare for Resurrection Sunday next week, the transition uh, that we have as uh, we picture our Savior uh, nearing just days from when he would be crucified and all the pain and suffering that he would go through and sort of to begin to prepare our hearts uh, for that and then, of course, a glorious, victorious resurrection. And uh, we'll enjoy that uh, next Sunday. And so Mark chapter 14, let me read these few verses for us. Mark chapter 14, and you follow along with me in your King James Bible there in verse number, beginning in verse uh, number 33. And the Bible says, He taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto him, my, to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. He went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what, what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto him, saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. Let's pray. Thought, Father, we do ask you in the moments that we have together uh, this morning, I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you would take your word and, Lord, we want to uh, magnify and exalt it as it certainly is worthy and deserving of. And I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you would help each of us, Lord, to be helped and encouraged and strengthened uh, because of what will be taught here today. So many wonderful truths that we can build upon just in these few short verses, but yet, Lord, they're so vital, uh, Lord, to our spiritual well-being, especially as we prepare uh, for next week. Lord, bless now today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated, uh, if you would, please. As we look at the description here on uh, our Savior, the description of Jesus Christ in the garden, uh, it surpasses our comprehension. There's no way we can probably or truly uh, ever comprehend the pain and the suffering uh, that our Savior would go through. And of course, God being omniscient and Jesus being omniscient, God in the flesh, He knew what all that pain would be. It's one thing to know there's some trials and heartaches that lie ahead, but it's another thing to know exactly what those trials are and exactly what those hardships are and when they would actually happen to our lives. And so our Savior here in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, leads us down a path of the deepest sorrow that we will ever see in the heart of our Savior up until this point, even greater uh, than the sorrow that he had when he looked over Jerusalem. Remember he said, uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and he wept over the city of Jerusalem, had such a heart uh, for the people that had no shepherd, no one to guide them and direct them and instruct them and uh, lead them in the ways of truth. Uh, the Garden of Gethsemane and the sorrow that would lie ahead in the days and just a few hours that lie ahead was, was greater even than the tears that he shed at uh, Lazarus' tomb and and the Bible says that he wept and his heart was heavy as he saw the, uh, the family grieving and they saw the family suffering. He knew just in a few moments that he would say Lazarus come forth, but yet he wept. And it's interesting to me, even knowing the answer to prayer that was around the corner, he knew the suffering they were going through, the family, and he came alongside them and wept with them and the burden that he had in his heart. But it was while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane that we see the deepest, most profound insight in the humanity of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. He was not 50% God and 50% man. He was 100%. And we see the humanity of Christ here in the Garden of Gethsemane as we see the suffering Savior as uh, he was knowing what lied, lied ahead uh, in the, the hours that uh, would be ahead of him. We see him, him, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, in all points was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And so everything that you and I have ever gone through, he went through it. Every sorrow that he ever felt, we have felt, that, that we feel, he felt it. And so he has all points like we were, but yet we can go to him to find strength and comfort and encouragement. Here we see Jesus as a man suffering the agony of temptation, but yet trusting God through the agony that he was going through. Uh, going through a very difficult time of adversity, but yet believing and relying upon God uh, every step of the way. We see Jesus here. He shows us how to battle Satan and trust God at the same time. 
sort of like a, a sword in one hand and, and another uh, sword in the other hand and fighting different battles, trusting God and the adversities uh, that were with him against him at that time. And so Jesus was probably at this time, on the earth at this time, was facing the hardest time in his entire life and ministry. He had never experienced this before. Uh, and uh, this was something, he shed tears. Yes, he grieved and was sorrowful, but never like uh, this moment. The Bible goes on to tell us uh, as uh, what was about to happen, that uh, he knew what was about to happen. But look what he says here to his disciples. He turns to them and he says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. He says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Uh, what was this exceeding sorrow that Jesus felt? What was this burden that was bogging our Savior down and just overweighing Him and weighing upon Him. And the Bible says it was an exceeding sorrow uh, that was upon Him at that time. Uh, when was the load that He was carrying? As we see in Mark 14, verse 36, and He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto Thee. Take away this cup from Me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what Thou wilt. And so there was such anguish, there was such sorrow, and exceeding sorrow, for it was so much so that He go, went to God the Father and says, is there any way possible that this can be passed? Is there any way possible that I don't have to drink uh, this cup of, of, the, of, the, of, what the, of what would be given uh, at this time when he says, uh, take away this cup from me? He had already told his disciples and forecasted and told them what was about to take place. He was soon to die. In just a few short hours, the Savior uh, would be tormented physically beyond measure, recognition beyond measure. And uh, you know the story, we'll go into a little bit more of it next Sunday, but all the suffering physically that he went through. But what was this exceeding sorrow that Jesus was feeling? We get the answer to that question as we hear the prayer that Jesus prayed to the Father. He's referring to something that causes him such great sorrow, exceeding sorrow, that he goes as far to ask the Father to take it from him. He says, with this cup, uh, the cup is a reference, as we see here in the Old Testament, refers to a cup that contains the wrath of God upon the sin of man. The wrath of God upon the sin of man. This is a cup that Jesus is referring. He's going to suffer betrayal. He's going to suffer abandonment. He's going to suffer arrest and imprisonment and torture and beatings and mocking and crucifixion. But worse than all that, the wrath of God would be upon him and the cup of the wrath of God uh, he would have to bear in his own body not just the guilt of the sins of all mankind but the condemnation and the wrath of God would be placed upon him at that moment. And he says, I'm exceeding sorrowful there in the garden of Gethsemane. Paul summarizes this uh, meaning of this great event in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 where it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, it was there at Golgotha that God poured out his wrath, full strength, undiluted upon his own son, to bear the wrath of God in his own body for your sins and for my sins and for all the sins of mankind from ever beginning until he comes back again. And Paul said it so clearly when he says he has borne our sin. He has paid our sin debt. And so Jesus endured the wrath of God. He drank the cup of God's wrath so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we also can enjoy salvation. And when we take of the Lord's Supper and we drink of that cup, it reminds us of the victory we have. It reminds us of the death and that burial and that resurrection. And and though he drank the cup of the wrath of God, we can enjoy the cup of blessing of being reunited with God forever. Sins forgiven because he bore that price for us on the cross. He endured the wrath of God. Oh yes, the physical torment that Jesus was going through, uh, would go through, was tremendous. But the torment of bearing the sins of so many was a much, much greater weight upon him. He bore the guilt of the full weight of our sin and he also took the full wrath of God upon, our, upon himself. He suffered my hell. He suffered your hell. He paid a debt he did not owe and I owe a debt I could not pay but Jesus, he suffered the 
divine wrath of God, the condemnation of God upon his life as he bore our sins so that we can achieve and obtain forgiveness of our sins. This, the Bible says, he agreed to do, and he did it willingly. The Bible says, nevertheless, not what I will, but thou will. Oh, we see a Savior that was submissive to the will of God, even if it meant bearing the wrath of God, even if it meant drinking of the cup of the wrath of God, and he did it with a willing heart. Isaiah 53 says he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a, as a sheep before his shears is done, and so he opened not his mouth. He didn't resist it. He didn't fight against it. He didn't try to pull away from it. He surrendered and submitted to the will of God, not thy, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. We see in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, who his own self bear our sins, his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you're healed for you're as sheep going astray but are now returned on the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And so we see our Savior and he's there in the garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says he was exceeding sorrowful. Exceeding sorrowful. Now in your Bibles, I want you to go back if you're still there in the Mark. And I want you to highlight a couple of words or underline a couple of words here. And we're going to look at this thought here today as we see the Savior's exceeding sorrow. I want you to notice the word sorrow there, the word sorrowful uh, in your Bible. And that's just a, a burden that you're called to bear. That's a weight you have to carry. That's a trial uh, that you've got to carry. That's a hardship that you have in your life. That's a, a, a strain, a stress that you're going through in your life. That's a sorrow in your life. But I want you to also underline the word exceeding and uh, under that right next to that it's more than you can handle it's more than you can bear it's more than, than than the weight of your body can do and so there's sorrow in your life those are trials and burdens and hardships and and, and uh, anxieties and stresses and strains but then there's also where those sorrows become an exceeding sorrow it's more than you can bear it's more than you can carry it's more you can handle it's just weighing you down beyond comprehension and so God tells us that there's going to be times that people have sorrow. And that we're all acquainted with that. But there's also going to be times when that sorrow becomes an exceeding sorrow. It just sort of is, is that added weight and, and it just sort of crushes us and, and pushes us down as though I don't know uh, if I can make another step and I don't know if I can go another a day and I don't know if I can serve and live for God another moment. And it's just an exceeding sorrow that's in our life and there our Savior was with that exceeding sorrow. There are things that we carry as a weight and there are times when that weight becomes so heavy we just can't carry it. There's times that we bear the burdens for a while and we can do that for a while but then there comes a time when, the, when we're buried beneath the load of the burden and it just overwhelms us. It overpowers us. It engulfs us and we look up with no hope of light at the end of the tunnel. It's just that exceeding sorrow in our life. You see, exceeding sorrowful is a sorrow you can't bear any longer. That exceeding sorrowful is a sorrow that you cannot carry any longer. That exceeding sorrowful is a sorrow you cannot take another step. No matter how well we try to plan out our lives, no matter how well we try to structure our lives, you're going to face some sorrows in your life. And those sorrows, some of them will transition to an exceeding sorrow. What are we to do when our sorrow becomes an exceeding sorrow? What must we do to survive the exceeding sorrowfulness in our lives as our Savior experienced here in the Garden of Gethsemane? There are several things that we can look at as we see this passage of Scripture in Mark uh, chapter number 14. I want you to first off, as you're in our, uh, looking at our Bible here, uh, as uh, the Bible gives us this very important truth here. Look, if you would, down uh, at a couple of verses I want you, uh, want you to see where he says, uh, and he said, uh, verse number um, 32, they came to the place that was named Gethsemane and saith to the disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. He taketh with him Peter and James and John, and he begins sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Tarry ye here and watch. I want you to understand as you're going through maybe a time today in your life where your sorrow is an exceeding sorrow. I don't know what it is and nobody else maybe knows what it is, but that sorrow is transitioned to where it's a load you can't carry any longer. It's a burden that's well beyond your ability to bear. It's an area in your life that you cannot get enough strength to take another step 
What are you to do? What hope is there for us that are bogged down with that exceeding sorrow? May I say first and foremost, we better make sure that you guard your spirit in those times of exceeding sorrow. Guard your spirit in times of that exceeding sorrow that comes to your life. You see, our spirit is our disposition. Our spirit is our disposition. Our disposition is an aspect of our character. Character is a collection of personality traits within our behavior that reflects who we are. It's seen our integrity, our attitudes, our moral fiber, our disposition, how we treat those around us. You see, our spirit is how we respond when something negative happens in your life. Uh, your spirit is how you respond when something uncomfortable comes to your life. Your spirit is how you respond to the trials and adversities, those negative negative things in your life how do you respond when those things come into your life those unfavorable circumstances in your life you better guard your spirit you know why there's an adversary the devil as a roaring lion he walks about seeking to devour and what's he want to devour he wants to devour your spirit he wants your spirit today he wants your disposition he wants your outlook in life he wants your focal point of what the li what lies ahead in the future he wants you discouraged and despair and despondent he wants your spirit today and he wants to get it. He wants to use circumstances. He wants to use the things of life to get your spirit. Satan is after your spirit. He wants to use negative words of others to breach your spirit. He wants to use the negative words of others to breach your spirit. Take your Bibles, if you would, please. We'll come back to Mark in a moment. But take your Bibles, if you would, and go to Proverbs, please. And just building a little foundation here today. We'll come back to Mark 14 in a moment. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 4. Satan wants your spirit. He's going to do everything he can to get your spirit. And one of the ways he wants to get your spirit, he wants to breach. He wants to breach your spirit by using negative words of others. To get your spirit breached. Proverbs 15 and verse number 4. Proverbs 15 and verse number 4. The Bible says a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Well, look what it says. But perverseness therein is what? It's a breach in the spirit. A breach in the spirit. You see Satan wants your spirit. And he'll use as we see in this verse. Wholesome words are a tree of life. Wholesome words build you up. Wholesome words encourage you. Wholesome words strengthen you. But those negative words from others can breach your spirit. In this proverb Solomon states a principle. That's repeated all throughout the Bible. Especially in the book of Proverbs. Words can encourage you or crush you. Words can build you up or tear you down. And uh, we often as kids grow up, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names and words will never hurt. That's not true. The Bible tells us time and time again the power of words to build up, to strengthen, or to also tear down and destroy. King Solomon commended the value of good words, wholesome words, and condemned the damage of perverse speech. A perverse speech. By your speech, you're either a tree of life or you're causing others to have their spirit breached by what you say. That's why the Bible says, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Why? Because the words you say as a dad to that son and that daughter can cause a breach in their spirit. And that breach in their spirit is what Satan wants to do because if that spirit has been breached, then that opens up a reservoir, a, a, an opening, an avenue for Satan to come into their lives and wreck ruin and havoc in their lives. You either heal or help with your words or you either hurt and injure with your words, a man whose speech is perverse destroys his neighbors. Proverbs 11, 9 says, A hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. You see, words can and do destroy. They'll destroy lies. They'll destroy friendships. They'll destroy churches. They'll destroy families. They'll destroy marriages. They'll destroy relationships of all kinds. Your words, a breach of spirit by the negative words, the hurtful words that are said, critical words, sarcastic words, mean words that are said to us. Satan wants your spirit, but he doesn't just want your spirit through the hurt words or negative words of others that you can give, the breach of spirit, but Satan also is after your spirit to use unconfessed sins in your life to break your spirit. To break your spirit. Take your Bibles. You're in Proverbs there. Go to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. Satan wants your spirit. He doesn't want you to have a good spirit. Why? A strong spirit is going to do some great things for God. A strong spirit is going to move forward for God. But he wants your spirit to be breached. A breached spirit through hurtful words and negative words are said to you and about you 
in regards to your spirit. He goes on to say, Satan wants your spirit. He wants, uh, because of unconfessed sins in your own life, to break your spirit. Proverbs 17, 22, Bible says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit, a broken spirit, Drieth the bones. Skip over to Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 13. Notice the correlation between a merry heart and a broken spirit. The opposite of a broken spirit is a merry heart. And when you have unconfessed sin in your life, you're not going to have a happy heart. There's not going to be a joy in your life. There's not going to be happiness on the outside. So when there's unconfessed sin, you set yourself up to have a broken spirit. When, you, uh, when you, the negative words are hurled against you, you're setting yourself up for a breach of spirit. Look in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. David described a broken spirit uh, was caused by sin in Psalm 6 and Psalm 38 and Psalm 51. It dried him up. It broke his bones. Miserable torment him from the inside out. He spent his time crying and grieving rather than rejoicing and living. Why? It was sin that was not dealt with. It was unconfessed sin. They wouldn't deal with. He excused it. He rationalized it. He put it on the carpet and he broke his spirit because of that unconfessed sin. Negative words can breach our spirit. Not just what's said to us, but we say to ourselves. You know, some of our worst enemies, worst words, we say negative words is what we say to ourselves, self-talk. And uh, boy, you, you listen to how you talk to yourself. Uh, you would never say that to anybody else, but you beat yourself up and you tear yourself down and uh, you hurt yourself. You cause a breach in your spirit. And then we have unconfessed sin that results in a broken, a broken spirit. A broken spirit is one that's lost its joy. It's being crushed and broken, leaving you hurting and joyless all because of that sin in your life. The devil delights in you and I having a broken spirit. We lose our joy, and when you lose your joy, you lose the testimony that you have from the Lord because you're focusing on your hurts. You're focusing on the things you're trying to cover up in your own life, and you're not focusing on God. Discontentment will break your spirit, for all you can think about is what you don't have. If you allow envy and bitterness and lust and resentment and anger in your life, you're setting yourself up. You have a broken spirit you brought it upon yourself because you've never dealt with that sin in a confessed way and gone before God if you don't forgive others you set yourself up for a broken spirit Satan doesn't want you to have a good spirit he doesn't want you to be strong in spirit he wants you to have a spirit that's breached negative words that uh, that you've heard uh, he wants your spirit to be broken sin that you don't deal with personally but satan is also after your spirit he wants to use the hurts of life to wound your spirit he wants to use the hurts of life to wound your spirit go to proverbs chapter 18 proverbs chapter 18 we see about that wounded spirit we've seen the breached spirit we've seen the broken spirit now we see in proverbs 18 14 the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. It doesn't matter what physical infirmity you have. If your spirit is strong, if your spirit is healthy, if your disposition is good, if your outlook is good in life, you can make it through the trial. You can make it through the hardship of life. But he goes on to say, he says, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? You see, a wounded spirit comes as a result of a reaction to negative words, events, actions, violation of your personal rights. It's a reaction that crushes you, knocks you down from where you cannot see to rise again. It knocks you down. It's that reaction you have that life's hurts. It's not the hurts that brings the wounds of a spirit. It's the reactions of the hurt that brings the wound of the spirit. Let me show that to you. Go to Proverbs chapter number 25. Proverbs chapter 25, page two over. Look what it says in verse number 28. Proverbs 25, verse number 28. The Bible says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. And so in Bible times, uh, if a city did not have walls around it, it was vulnerable to enemy attack. It was vulnerable to attacks of all the enemy cities that were around them. And so he's saying, uh, if you don't have uh, uh, your spirit under control, if you don't rule is the word the Bible uses, if you have no rule of your own spirit, he says you're like a city that is vulnerable. It's a, a city that's exposed. You have no defense against the adversary. You have no offense against, uh, defense against the attacks of the devil. You've got no walls up in your life. He says you've got to rule 
your spirit as a result. And so we see then that uh, the enemy comes when you're angry. He comes when you're angry in the same way. A person who has no rule over their spirit has no restraint, no defense against the impulsive emotions that are associated with life's hurts. Listen, hurts will come and life's hurts will come. Bible says in Job, man that is born of woman is few days and what? There's a lot of trouble. There's a lot of hurt. We can't avoid hurts, but we can build up some walls to protect us from being hurt by the hurts. We can build up some walls to protect us from having a wounded spirit because of the hurts. But if I don't rule my own spirit, I'm like a city whose walls have been torn down and exposed to what? A wounded spirit. A wounded spirit. Uh, because of life's hurts and I was not prepared by ruling my own spirit. I did not react rightly in regards to the hurts that were against me and I had a wounded spirit. A wounded spirit. Uh, you see, the enemy comes when you're angry. He comes when your temper gets out of control. He comes when you're in a rage. He comes when you lack faith. He comes when you're depressed. He comes when you criticize. He comes when you gossip. He comes when you lose control of your lust and more. And, uh, and he does what? You're, you have no control of your spirit. If you have no control of your spirit, you have no walls that protect you from having what? A wounded spirit. You've got to guard your heart from the issues of life. You've got to guard your spirit. How do, you, how do you build up walls in your life? You keep a right spirit. A right spirit is a wall that you build up. That's what he says. You've got to control your spirit. You've got to rule your spirit because hurts will come. And if you don't have control of your spirit concerning the hurts that come, your spirit, if you don't have control of that, and you allow the hurt to determine how you feel, you allow the hurt to determine how you react, if you allow the hurts to determine how you behave, then you're like a city with no walls because you have no control and no rule over your spirit. Keeping a right spirit is the wall. Daniel was upheld. Because he had an excellent spirit. What kept him from compromising uh, when the, the decree was passed? What kept him from turning back? He built some walls. What was his wall? He had an excellent spirit. He had an excellent spirit. What was it that Joshua and Caleb had that protected them uh, from a caving and compromising? Oh, they had another spirit. Unlike those other ten spies that went out, they said, we can do it. We can well able to do it. They had an excellent spirit. They had another spirit. They guarded, they ruled their spirit. So they didn't allow the hurts of life that caused their life to be exposed because they ruled their own spirit. So they weren't exposed to a wounded spirit. You've got, you have to rule your spirit. If you don't rule your spirit, the hurts of life will wound your spirit. Life hurts. We see this, Paul put it this way in Ephesians 4. He said, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. He says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Why? You're going to give a foothold to the devil. You're going to give a place to the devil. You better rule your spirit. You better apologize. You better get this thing right. You better not go to bed hangry. Why? Because you're going to go to bed with your walls down. And when your walls down, you're going to wake up with a wounded spirit. You're going to wake up with a hurting heart. You're going to wake up offended. Why? You didn't guard with a right spirit. You didn't put up a right wall of a right spirit disposition. When that hurt came in your life. You see, life's hurts don't hurt us. We get hurt when we let down our guard by not ruling our spirits. We love to put the blame on someone offended me and therefore he wounded my spirit. Listen, nobody can wound my spirit. But I, can, I cannot take control of my own spirit. I can tear down the walls of my own spirit. I can, try, I can allow the hurts of life to wound my spirit because I didn't rule my spirit. And if I didn't rule my spirit, the walls are down. And now I'm susceptible and vulnerable to being offended. We see in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. What's God saying? The message is this. You better rule your spirit. You better manage your emotions. And don't let your emotions manage you. I'm sorry you were hurt. But build up the walls and keep a right spirit. I'm sorry you were disappointed. But build up the walls and keep a right spirit. I'm sorry someone was said wrong. But build up a wall and build up and protect your spirit. Why? Because if you don't rule your spirit, then the situations of life will wound your spirit. You can blame it on someone else for wounding your spirit, but the wounded spirit, the breached spirit, the, the uh, broken spirit, it's all dependent on me. Well, you broke my spirit. No, I allowed it. You breached my spirit. No, I, I allowed it. Uh, you wounded my spirit. No, I allowed it because I didn't take rule 
of my own spirit in my life. See, ruling your spirit means exercising power over yourself. It is keeping yourself under control. It is discipline over your inner desires, your inner impulses, your inner thoughts, your inner actions, your inner words. For the Christian, our spirit is what? It's the mind of Christ. Put on the mind of Christ. As we allow the mind of Christ to saturate our minds, then we allow our spirit to be a Christ-like spirit. We allow our disposition to be a Christ-like disposition. And we build some walls that are invincible to the hurts of life. Because we allow our spirit. Listen, when Jesus was exceeding sorrowful, you better guard your spirit. You better guard your spirit when sorrow transitions to exceeding sorrow in your life. Because the sorrows are going to come. The hardships are going to come. The trials are going to come in our lives. You see, if you don't rule your spirit, your spirit will rule you. And the result will always be a wounded spirit. A wounded spirit is when we allow our spirit to be ruled by outside hurts, by outside forces, rather than taking rule of our spirit and guarding and protecting the walls by the spirit of a good disposition. Now, it's during those times when your sorrow turns to exceeding sorrow that the Bible says you need grace for your spirit. You need grace for your spirit. Can you go with me and look at a couple of verses here in Galatians chapter number 6? Galatians chapter number 6. You see, without grace for our spirit, my spirit will be breached by the words that are said that are hurtful. Without the grace for my spirit, my spirit will be broken because of unconfessed sin in my own life. Without the grace of my spirit, I will allow life's hurts to wound my spirit. I must have grace, grace for our spirit. Look what it says in Galatians 6.18. Brethren, the grace, 6.18, Galatians 6.18. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with what? Your spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be what? With your spirit. God says you're going to need grace for your spirit. You know why? Because Satan's after your spirit. You're at your disposition. Your outlook on life. And he's going to use, he's going to try to breach your spirit through hurtful words and criticism and sarcasm and things that are said and implied. He's going to try to uh, break your spirit through unconfessed sin that you don't deal with. And he's going to try to wound your spirit through life's hurts that you don't rule your spirit to keep that wall up. And you allow the hurts to wound your spirit because you didn't guard with the wall. Go to Philemon, Philemon, over a couple other pages there from uh, Galatians. So he said, I'm going to give you grace for your spirit, for your spirit. Philemon 25, there's only the one chapter, Philemon verse 25. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Your spirit. See, the only way I can avoid a breach of spirit, a broken spirit, and a wounded spirit, is I need grace for my spirit. You need grace for your spirit today. You need the grace of God for your spirit you see, without the grace for your spirit, then your spirit will become breached. Without the grace for your spirit, your spirit will become broken. Without the grace for your spirit, your spirit will become wounded. And many today, you have a breached spirit. Many of you have a broken spirit. Many of you have a wounded spirit. And it's all because God said, listen, you need grace, grace for your spirit today. You see, you don't need grace just in order to be saved. You need grace for your spirit for the journey in a sinful, hurtful, painful world. you got to have grace in this journey of life if you're going to make it to the end of the trail. Perhaps you need grace for your spirit today to endure the sins of others towards you. Perhaps you need the grace for your spirit today to face a trial that weighs you down that nobody else knows about. Perhaps you need grace for your spirit because of the circumstance in your marriage today or within your own family. Perhaps you need grace for your spirit today to sustain you through the burdens that are just too hard to carry and too heavy to carry. And today, more than ever, you need grace for your spirit. Oh, it's a breached spirit today, but there is hope. There is healing. There's a broken spirit today, but there is help. There is healing. Oh, there's a wounded spirit, but there is help. Help. There is healing. It's the grace of God for your spirit that will bring healing and restoration to each of those spirits today that maybe are plaguing us this morning. Perhaps you need grace for that spirit today, for that load that is way too heavy. It is of absolute importance to healing our broken and a breach and a wounded spirit. You've got to apply 
the grace of God to your spirit. If not, you're going to be wounded. If not, your spirit's in the Bible says a wounded spirit. Who can bear? I mean, a breathed spirit, you're, going to, you're not going to make it. A broken spirit, you're not going to make it. It's like going with several cylinders around. It's going to be a rough road. It's going to be a rough ride. But with your spirit in tune, it's going to be a wonderful journey. But God says that's why you need grace. Grace for your spirit. It's of absolute importance. Many of you allowed your spirit in times of exceeding sorrow to do things that you later had wished you had never done. Many have lashed out in anger in times of exceeding sorrow. You didn't intend to act that way. Many have made devastating decisions in times of exceeding sorrow. Many have behaved in ways that were out of character for you in times of exceeding sorrow. But don't allow the burden that's become an exceeding burden to get your spirit today. Don't allow the heartache uh, that has become an exceeding heartache to get your spirit today. Don't allow the disappointment that's become an exceeding disappointment. Don't let it get your spirit today. Don't allow the hurt that's become an exceeding hurt get your spirit today. Don't allow your sorrow that's become an exceeding sorrow. Don't let it get your spirit. Guard your spirit. Satan wants your spirit. He wants that disposition, your outlook on life, your attitude, the life that looks ahead, the, the, the brightness of the future. He doesn't want you to have that. He wants to have a breach and a broken and a wounded spirit. You see, grace for your spirit will protect your spirit from becoming bitter, from becoming angry, from becoming resentful, from becoming fretful, from becoming vengeful, which are all our sinful reactions to life's hurts. Grace for your spirit will protect your spirit from being breached. It'll protect your spirit from being broken. It'll protect your spirit from being wounded. Why? I've got to have the grace of God. Preacher, what do I do? Uh, my sorrow has gone to exceeding. My hurt has gone to exceeding hurt. My problems have gone to exceeding. My, my pain has gone to exceeding. What do I do? You've got to guard your spirit. Because Satan wants to use all of those things to cause damage to your spirit. Now go back to our verse, if you would. I want you to notice what happened here. Back to Mark, chapter 14, chapter 14 of Mark. Jesus is giving what we need to do in times of exceeding sorrow. Look what it says if we look at the verse. It says, it was during this time when Jesus was exceeding sorrowful unto death. Look what the Bible says. It says he went forward a little. See that phrase? He went forward a little. He was exceeding sorrowful. Beyond measure. He couldn't bear anything else that was upon his life. It was well beyond what he could imagine uh, on his own. He was there and he says, listen, it's beyond hope and, and I'm exceeding sorrowful. I'm exceeding sorrowful. I'm exceeding sorrowful. But look at verse 35. And he went forward a little. You say, what do you do when it's exceeding sorrowful? You better guard your spirit. Number two, go forward a little. Go forward as far as you can. Go forward as far as you can. He went forward a little. The load may be heavy, but listen, you can go forward a little more. You can go forward a little farther. You can go forward a little bit. The trial may be unbearable. I may not be able to go forward as far as I thought I could. I may not be able to go as fast as I once was. I may not be able to do what I once did. But listen, I can go forward a little bit. I'm under exceeding struggle. I'm under exceeding trial. I'm under exceeding pain. But I can go forward a little. And Jesus went forward a little. He went forward a little bit. Didn't go a long ways. But he wasn't staying back. He wasn't sitting back. He went forward a little. You see, when sorrow becomes exceeding sorrow, that's a time to go forward as far as you can. When sorrow becomes exceeding sorrowful, that's for, that's what time you got to go forward a little bit more. You see, the worst thing to do in times of exceeding sorrow is to stop. It's to quit. It's to stop doing what you know you ought to do. It's to quit church. It's to quit your Bible. It's to quit your soul winning. It's to quit your praying. It's to quit your duties at church. Listen, when you're at the exceeding part of your life, go forward. A little bit. Keep on going forward. You say, preacher, you better guard your spirit. And while you're guarding your spirit, go forward a little bit. Now listen, Jesus' perfect humanity here is bearing all points like us. He's showing us how to deal with these exceeding times in our life. And he says, you better guard your spirit 
and you better make sure that you go forward. Don't stop. Don't turn back. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep going forward in your Bible reading. Keep going forward in serving God. Keep going forward in your walk with God. Keep going forward. Why? Going forward motion keeps you from getting bitter. Going forward motion keeps you from feeling sorry for yourself. Going forward prevents you from sulking and feeling sorry. Going forward keeps you from turning back. You've got to go forward. Even if it's just a little bit. Go forward a little. A little bit he went forward. The spirit is under attack. He said, I want you to go forward. No time for sulking. Time to go forward. No time to feel sorry for myself. Time to go forward. It's going forward that keeps me from turning back. It's going forward that prevents Satan from gaining the victory in my life. Why? He wants me to be destroyed. He wants me to be sidetracked. He doesn't want me to use of God. And if he can get me to sit and sour and stop and revert and go back, then what's happened? He's got the victory. But greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We can do all things through Christ that strength us. We have the power to move forward. You can go a little forward. You may not be able to go as much as you'd like to go. But you can go forward a little bit. You may not be able to go forward as you were planning to go a month ago or a year ago, but we all can go forward a little bit. Don't quit. Don't run home. Don't hibernate. Don't sulk. Don't feel sorry for yourself. It's time to what? Go forward a little bit. It's time to go forward a little bit. But notice what happens. In our verse, he went forward a little. And then look what the Bible says. He fell on the ground. He didn't go very far before he fell. He fell. Now when we think of falling, we think of someone falling into sin, don't we? Oh boy, he fell. Fell into sin. And boy, he really messed up his life. Fell back in the old lifestyle, the old ways of living. And uh, yielded to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Boy, they fell. They fell. Oh, Jesus is not falling here because of any sin he'd ever committed. He's falling. Why? He's burdened down with an exceeding burden. He's uh, loaded down with an exceeding sorrow. And he went a little further. And he fell. He fell. He wasn't sinning. He had a load he was carrying that was just too heavy. He had a burden he was carrying that was just too heavy. He had a weight that was well beyond his ability to carry. And he fell. He fell. He's showing us how to deal with exceeding sorrow. He says you've got to guard your spirit. He says you better make sure you just go forward, don't stop. Don't go back. Even if it's a little motion forward, it's the best motion you'll ever take. And then the Bible says he fell. But notice what else happens if you see this, this story. So you see here he went, and my soul's exceeding sorrowful, he says. Terry, ye here, watch. He went forward a little, and he fell on the ground. And you do one of two things when you fall. You get mad at God, you get bitter at God, you can complain at God, you can convince yourself God didn't care and God didn't love you and you can all get in your old self-pity party or you can call out to God in prayer for help. Say, God, I need your strength. I can't do it. I'm trying to make it and I just, I'm just bogged down and, and I could do the sorrow for a while and I could do the burden for a while and, and the load was okay for a while but it's an exceeding load right now. It's an exceeding burden right now. It's an exceeding pain right now. God, I just can't do it. I'll go a little further forward and he fell and you get mad at God. You can blame God for giving you more than you can handle as you thought. You can blame God for not loving you or you can look up like our Savior did and he prayed. He prayed for help, for direction, for strength. He says, God, I must have your help. And that's all prayer is, is getting God involved in our life. He looked up to God and prayed and says, God, I need your, str your strength. Under this load, I can't go on. I can't go on. I can't go on. You fall and you're complaining. You're falling, you're griping. You're falling, you're placing blame on somebody else. God says, if you fall, you can do one of two things. You can pray. And realize, God, I, I can't do it. I can't go another step. It's just so hard. It's just so hard. I just can't go on. It's a burden I can't bear. And I, I just don't know how I can do it, God. And please, I don't know what to do, but God, would you help me? I need your strength and I need some courage to go on again. God, would you help me? He prayed. But notice, as we continue this verse here, 
went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed. If it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup, please. Please take away the burden that's so exceeding. The hurt is so exceeding. The hardship is so exceeding, but nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. He prayed, and that's the number four. He accepted God's will for his life. He accepted God's will for his life. He realized that this was in God's plan and God's purpose. He was going to accept it, embrace it, nevertheless. Now, there's a difference of whether you make it or not. We could not have the book of Job today if it wasn't for Job's willingness to trust God, though he slay me. I'll trust him. There's a difference whether you make it or not. You can fight against what your lot in life is, and you can gripe about it all you want. You can fight against all you want, or you can say, nevertheless, God, I, I need your help, and, and God, I, I want your will to be done because I'm better off having your will in your presence than forcing my will in my direction. God, not my will, but thy will be done. And he called out and he accepted God's will for his life. As Paul said, my grace is sufficient for thee. He called out to God three times. God, would you please remove the thorn in the flesh? Would you please, God? Would you please, God? And each time God said, my grace is sufficient. Grace for what? Your spirit. You better guard your spirit. You need grace for salvation. But you need grace for your spirit. On this journey of life, if you don't have grace for your spirit, then you're going to allow the, the hardships of life and the harshness of words of life and, and the unconfessed sin in your own heart to breach your spirit and to break your spirit and to wound your spirit. But if you have grace for your spirit... You can have a disposition like Daniel. You can have a disposition like, Shad like uh, Joshua and Caleb that had another spirit, an excellent spirit, in spite of all that they went through. Let's go on. So I say you better guard your spirit. You've got to go forward a little. Can't stop. Can't go back. You've got to go forward a little. He fell. He fell. He didn't go very far. He fell, but then he prayed. He adapted and embraced God's will. Well, let's read on. The Bible says, and he cometh and findeth them sleeping. And saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst thou not watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. Notice verse 39. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. Here's number five. Do again what you did at first. Do again what you did at first. Do again what you did at first. You see, his sorrow had become exceeding sorrowful. He had to guard his spirit. He had to make sure that in guarding that spirit that he understood that I got to just go forward a little bit. I go forward a little bit. And then he fell. But when he failed, he had a choice to either call out to God and say, God, I need your help and I need your strength. And God, please, would you help me? And they accepted God's will. And then we do. He went and did again what he first did. He went back and guarded his spirit. He went back and did what he first did. He went forward a little bit further. You see, you go forward again a little bit more. And then you pray again a little bit more. And then you accept God's will again. Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter temptation. And again, verse 39, he went away and prayed and spake the same words. You see, after going forward a little, get up and go forward a little further again. Go forward a little further again until you fall for the weight of the load. And then pray. And then accept God's will. And then do it again. And do it again. That's how you get through. That's how you get through. That's what our Savior is showing us. You're, you're, you're a preacher. I, I, I'm not on the sorrow stage. I've been there. And I can deal with that for a while. I'm not under the burden stage because I can deal with that for a while. I'm not under the hurt stage. I can deal with that for a while. But preacher, really, I'm under that exceeding time in my life. I, if I just don't know what to do. There's no light in the tunnel. What do I do? You do what Jesus did. You guard your spirit. And you go a little further forward. And you go until you fall down under the load of the, the load that is bearing you down. And you look up to God 
on pray for new strength and new power and new help and then you look to God for that help and you release and say God not my will but thy will be done and then you go and do it again and you do it again and you do it again until you get through the exceeding sorrow because it will come to pass Sunday did show up resurrection did show up Oh, it didn't look good in the days that preceded. Didn't look good as he hung there on the cross. It didn't look good, but listen, Sunday showed up, and resurrection showed up, and victory over sin showed up, and victory over death showed up, and victory over hell showed up, and victory will show up in your life. But you've got to do what God says he did and showed us that you've got to follow this pattern if we're going to make it through the exceeding hurts and pains and hardships of life. We all face sorrow, and we all will face exceeding sorrow. The difference is whether or not you guard your spirit from being breached, broken, or wounded. That's where it starts. Because once the spirit's been breached or broken or wounded, you're vulnerable. Your emotions are out of control. You're not ruling your spirit. Your spirit is, is exposed to the darts of the devil, the adversary. You're vulnerable. And God says, listen, you've got to come to the place where you say, God, I've got to have your strength and your power. I need to come back and build up the walls. I need to have a right spirit. Renew a right spirit within me, God. I've got to get my spirit right. I've got to have a healthy spirit, a strong spirit, a good spirit. The Bible says a just man falls seven times and he riseth up, what? Again and again and again. Go a little further forward and you'll fall under the way. But get up again and go a little further forward and you'll fall under the way. But get up again and fall a little forward and go a little further forward and you'll fall again. But get up because a just man falleth seven times. But he doesn't stay down. He does again what he did when he first fell. So he doesn't stay down again. Last verse here it is, Luke 2.40. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. You know who that's talking about? Jesus as a young boy. Jesus as a young boy. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. And the child grew. Jesus as a young man grew. Why? He needed grace on his life as a young person. Why? Because he's going to have a mom and dad sometime that's not fair. Say some hurtful words to him. Some things come in their life that are hurtful. And he said, listen, you need grace for your spirit. As a young teenager, as a young person, if you don't have grace for your spirit, you'll turn out to be a single person, an older person that's cranky, cantankerous, and mean if you don't have grace for your spirit. Look what it says in Luke 2.40. The child grew and waxed what? Strong in spirit. Strong, talking about Jesus. Strong in spirit. His disposition, his outlook. Why? Because Satan wants your spirit filled with wisdom. And notice now, and the grace of God was upon him. He did not need grace for salvation. He was a sinless sacrifice, a Passover lamb. The grace of God was upon him. Why? To guard his spirit, to allow the hurts of life, to allow the disappointments of those forsaking him, to allow the pain he go through on the cross from getting bitter and cantankerous and offended and breezed. It was guarded. Why? Because of the grace of God for his spirit. Listen, if our Savior needed grace for his spirit, are we any better to not know the need for grace for your spirit? You better realize the importance of grace for your spirit. Today, maybe you need to come and say, God, I'm falling. I'm about to fall. And God, I need your grace for my spirit. Because healing takes place of a breached, broken, wounded spirit. When the application of God's grace is placed upon you, that you're going to ask for. God, I want your grace for my spirit. I don't want to have a breached spirit. I don't want to have a broken spirit. I don't want to have a wounded spirit. God, would you allow me to reclaim my spirit for you? And David said, renew unto me a right spirit. I want to have a right spirit. Why? A right spirit is a strong spirit. A right spirit is a wall that you build up in your life, ruling your spirit. Ruling your spirit. As much as I'd like to blame you for breaching my spirit, for the words that you said, 
that were so hurtful to me. As much as I'd like to blame you for the unconfessed sin in my life that I've committed because of you acting a certain way, and that's why I've done what I've done. As much as I'd like to blame you for the life hurts that have been done to me that you've wounded my spirit, you cannot breach or break or wound my spirit. And no one can do that to you if you rule your spirit as a wall around your life. Because hurtful words will come. Hurtful words will come. And life's hurts will come if you've got a ruling of your spirit with God's help and God's grace. The grace of God was upon him. Jesus had the grace of God upon him. Why? He had to have a good spirit. And there's not a one of us say, you know, Jesus had a bad spirit. He, had a, he has an excellent spirit. It was because of the grace of God on his life. And if you have an excellent spirit today, it's not because you didn't have pain and suffering and trials and problems. If you have a great spirit today, it's not because you've been uh, you know, down a road with no problems and hardships. The reason you have a good spirit today is because you've embraced the grace of God for your spirit, for your spirit. And you've ruled your spirit to protect your spirit from being wounded, broken, and breached. Hey, go forward a little. And you're going to probably fall under the load. But when you fall, don't get mad at God. Look up to God in prayer and say, God, would you give me strength to get up? Would you give me strength for my spirit to rise again? Then yield your will to God's will. Say, Lord, if this is what I must bear, then I need grace for my spirit. And then you do it again. And then you do it again. And you'll come through. And Sunday will show up. Resurrection will show up. Doesn't seem like it right now. But Sunday's coming. Next Sunday, it's coming. Oh, it doesn't look good for our Savior in these, this week here. Doesn't look good. But Sunday's coming. And your Sunday's coming in your life. I know it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. But there is a Sunday on the horizon. Father, we thank you.